Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast, and I am Marcus. If only the world always worked the way it presented itself in these first two weeks of July 2022. Science, science everywhere, <laughs> at least in my bubble. James Webb, the first image is tears in the eyes of seasoned and highly decorated officials. Finally, a brief moment without the usual rut of gloom and doom. Yes, our world could be like that also, a world made of excitement and wonder. A world where no one has a problem, hopefully, when I say that most of us, and I suspect most scientists, have absolutely no idea what they are really looking at when they see the first images from the telescope. Because it is beyond the limits of our imagination. But don't get me wrong, of course science largely understands what's going on out there in those images. Why, for example, those cosmic cliffs, that stunning image with the brown dust in the lower half and the blue part at the top look the way to do and what's going on inside but what none of us understand and i'm going out on the limb here is the dimension of what they see we're playing with light years <laughs> a galaxy here a galaxy there <laughs> for heaven's sake the smallest known galaxy is 300 light years across <laughs> and we see hundreds of them in one image only <laughs> i need help now ladies and gentlemen i'm very pleased to have with me in the studio today Günther Hasinger, the science director of the european space agency esa since james webb is an international partnership between NASA and ESA, the ESA director is a key player in this fascinating project. And today, with me in the studio, welcome Günther Hasinger. So I'm responsible for all the scientific missions, uh, the ones in orbit and the ones which are being built and also the ones which have already been uh, flown and where their data are in the archive. So it's a, it's a wonderful job. It's probably the m most beautiful job I ever had. <laughs> I think um, you must have nerves of steel um, because I mean, like um, I have in fact nothing to do with the actual construction or making James Webb possible. But I almost fainted during that launching process because he was like so mind-bogglingly dangerous and anything could have happened all the time. So how was that to you? Yeah, that was really, um, we were hanging on our fingernails, I have to say. I mean, this, this was not <laughs> just the launch itself. But it was also the period leading up to the launch. Um, we were all hoping that we could have a big VIP tour to Kuru, um, where we would then celebrate the launch together. But then um, there were difficulties building up. Um, and so finally the launch shifted into exactly the Christmas um, period. There, there was one last um, kind of uh, little ripple that went through the telescope, which had to which uh, led to another two weeks delay. And then basically we were all um, <laughs> around Christmas hanging on our fingernails on the TV screens. <laughs> and, you know, the launch itself is always a major, um, I mean, it, it is really uh, blowing your chest, so to speak, when when you hear <laughs> and feel this, this sound, this vibrating atmosphere. Uh, and I'm unfortunately, I was only um, back on the, behind the TV screen. But we knew that there are so many things that could have gone wrong. Um, and uh, it was not just the launch itself. It was the 30 days of terror that were, happened afterwards, <laughs> where all of these usually, 350... You, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually it's, it's those seven minutes of terror, um, quoting the 
the descent on Mars. I mean, I, I think this is where it comes from. But you, indeed, you it's actually it's uh, it, and for Webb it was thirty days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, like um, this is not your regular mission because that mission built up decades ago. So this is not only a very expensive mission. Um, in fact, it's not like super expensive comparable to other missions because I mean like um, if you distribute that amount of money over decades and what it's worth, uh, it's it's a different story. But sometimes if people do not know what they're talking about, they would usually say it's an expensive mission. Is that right? Yeah. Actually, um, this is not the only space mission that takes ages. Uh, I mean, we, the first thing that you have to learn in space science is patience. And we have several <laughs> missions. I mean, for instance, we are we have we are preparing now Athena and Lisa, these big new flagship missions. They take thirty years before you can really uh, build them. Thirty, and it's yeah, so it's three zero years from. I mean, from the first uh, idea, <laughs> then you have to do technology transgenerational. <laughs> yes, and so this is actually something I read recently. A very nice comparison. You know, the people in the Middle Ages that built the cathedrals uh, in yes. Europe. Uh, to build a cathedral takes about 300 years or so. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the, the the people who start the building have to have a lot of trust in the next generation that they keep ca carrying it on. And so James Webb is in principle something like a modern cathedral. And actually wow. somebody said, if you want to rebuild the Dome of Cologne or one of these cathedrals today, it would cost roughly the same amount as the James Webb Space Telescope. So it is really a cathedral in science. Wow. Wow. Incredible. So this is um, a lot of, there's a lot of trust involved. Um, trust that the next generation will have similar ideas, I guess. Yeah. And will and, support, and and we'll support your idea. Yeah, and we'll pick it up basically. I mean, you you have to at some point you have to give the ball uh, to the next generation, and this is actually happening now. I mean, since a few days we are now in in formal operations, and now all these young people who are really already itching to get their hands on the data, they can now run uh, ahead and and uh, move on. <laughs> how does how does that feel? Um, to hand over that dear piece of incredible hardware you've been working on or many thousands of people have been working on for decades to hand it over to a next generation how does that feel i think in this particular case i mean usually when we do that with missions it's a relatively dry process so it's uh, one department in our directorate is then basically handing it over to the other department they just mm. check how many bills still have to be paid and so on <laughs> but in this particular case, I think it was very nice, uh, the amount of drama that has been created, I mean, all around the mission, yes. but then also in the handover with the day, with the image release that has happened. I mean, first with um, President Biden and then all around the world. Yeah. And then two days after the image release, um, the data has been released to the uh, astronomers. And indeed, NASA has, um, together with ESA and the Canadian Space Agency, had this final handover meeting where they basically moved it to official operations now. And oh. it's wonderful. It's, I would, it's really the yeah. fact that it happens under the eyes of the world and with so much excitement, this is really uh, just yes. appropriate. Yes. I would glue myself to my seat if I were in, in, a, in an executive role. But I guess there is mechanisms built inside that I would easily be removed, I guess. <laughs> Why would you glue yourself to the chair? I mean, you... You are sitting enough, I'm, so you can also do it from walking. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. So I'm not uh, needing uh, or I'm not um, expected to hand over my responsibilities to a younger generation because I'm I'm so I'm so invested in that project. Yeah. No, I, I believe it's not really a um, kind of a black and white handover process. It's a generational thing. I mean, there there are still lots of. People like myself, I'm burning to see my first own mm. James Webb data. I, together with yes. my former PhD students, we got 25 hours of web time. And wow. so this this will be wonderful to analyze it, to get your fingers dirty. You know, there's so nothing is, more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, there's go ahead, nothing go ahead. more. Um, there's nothing more exciting to um, a scientist 
to open a pack of data and look at things for the first time and to know that you are the first one and nobody else has that has ever seen that i mean it's not always that you open a package and then you discover something immediately but but just (laughs) the feeling of looking at something for the first time that nobody else has seen is is uh, part of the excitement and the discovery so what are you dedicating your 25 hours to (laughs) <laughs> you know that I'm uh, an X-ray astronomer by uh, mm-hmm. education, and so we we have observed the uh, X-ray sky very deeply. Um, and we, I'm ma- mainly interested in how the first generation of black holes were fo- was formed. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, when you look at with a with a deep X-ray telescope, then the sky is full of black holes. You you see black holes everywhere, and we have selected a group of black holes which are maybe in a total about 40 objects. We, we have discovered 4,000 black holes in this um, region, and 1% mm-hmm. of them has no optical counterpart whatsoever. I mean, usually you, you have something in X-rays, and then you go to the Hubble Space Telescope and see what is there in the optical. Then you go to the Keck Telescope mm-hmm. and try to get the, the spectrum, the fingerprints, and then you can tell what it is, where it is, and so on. But there is a group of about 1% of those black holes which are completely devoid of any optical signature. Uh, But Mm -hmm. then they are visible in the infrared again uh, Mm -hmm. with Spitzer and with others. And so those are prime targets because uh, nobody could have discovered them before and Webb is urgently needed to determine where they are. And, And they may very well be the first generation of black holes that we know. Wow. So you were just mentioning, um, um, we're talking about a certain region um, in space yes. that you're focusing on, 4,000 black holes in that region. region. Yeah. How, 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 what kind of, so to a layperson, how big is that region? So, so we yeah. have that beautiful comparison with that grain of sand uh, at an yes, arm's indeed. length. So, <laughs> so is that, uh, this, is that the this... region you're talking about? No, this region is actually a special region. It's called the Cosmos Field. Uh, mm-hmm. And it has already been covered to death with um, Hubble, with Chandra, with XMM Newton, with all the, with Herschel, uh, with, with all the telescopes that we have. And it will also be covered by James Webb. Um, and this is actually the largest individual proposal that has been distributed to. I mean, our group, I mean, I'm, I'm only mm-hmm. laterally involved there, but uh, this is the Cosmos Field. And the Cosmos Field is two square degrees wide. So it's about uh, 10 times the size of the full moon. So it's in principle quite, quite large mm-hmm. compared to this mm-hmm. grain of salt. And mm-hmm. in this field um, uh, with Chandra and XM Newton, we have discovered on the order of 4,000 black holes. Wow. And uh, 40 of them are, are still uh, kind of lacking um, identification. It's um it's so incredible considering the fact that our knowledge of black holes that they exist in the first place is not that long ago. So isn't that fascinating? That's also true. That's really fascinating. Yeah, and I think the 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 X rays are playing an important role here because um, uh, black holes are trans uh, basically changing energy into light uh, mm-hmm. very efficiently, uh, and X rays are I think a, a prime channel where you can discover those black holes. But the, the whole story goes even further because in the meantime, this was after we have submitted our um, James Webb proposal. In the meantime, I got very excited about the idea whether black holes could actually provide the dark matter, whether the dark matter is made mm-hmm. of primordial black holes. And if that is uh, true, then James Webb could discover those, um, not, not the black holes themselves, but they would actually motivate uh, and in, ignite early star formation, much earlier than the mm-hmm. normal dark matter. And so if this is true, then James Webb would actually see about 10 times more of these very faint wow. red galaxies than than were expected before. Wow. Wow. Please excuse my, my, my next question. We're diving too deeply already into the fact of the matter. But speaking of black holes, you're an expert. Um, is the end, is our end as humanity all doomed by black holes because we're all being sucked in into a black hole at some point because there's so many nope. out there. It's like magnets hovering all over the place, sucking everything no, in. Is no, that a you don't you don't have to you don't have to worry for that. I, I think if, if dark matter is made out of black holes, 
black holes are actually much more ubiquitous than uh, we have believed before. That means that every solar system in principle should have a black hole inside. And that would mean our own solar system also has a little black hole, um, a planetary mm. mass black hole, which we have not yet. So it's there, there could be a ninth planet, which is actually a black hole, but it is only about the size of um, your, your fist. Mm. But you know, this, the same way that the planets do not fall into the sun and the rings of Saturn do not fall into, the, um, uh, into Saturn, uh, it's it's usually it doesn't you fall, you don't fall into a black hole because you are safely in an orbit around it. You only fall into a black hole if there are two galaxies crashing into each other and there's a huge mm -hmm. mess going on and then everything is um, fall. So despite the fact that maybe the black holes are the most longest lived entity in the whole universe, everything else will be gone and the black holes will still be there. Uh, we will mm. not be sucked in. I mean. I think our protons will dissolve earlier than uh, we would suck <laughs> into a black hole. And our real problem is climate change, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, all right. Um, Günther Hasinger. Um, your first reaction. So the first images um, drop in. We've all, I guess, so we do not need to go into too much detail. We've all seen them, those beautiful images uh, that got released, especially also Jupiter um, last week. Um, yes. Yeah, now, yeah, what, yeah. what is, what, what um, print are you ordering um, for your living room? Which, what's your favorite image? So, so now I have to say, when I saw the... The images first and actually we even myself only saw them basically just a few hours before they were released so they, they were actually a masters of secrecy uh, in this whole uh, arena but i have to say that when i when i opened the computer and saw them first i was first a little bit disappointed uh, mm. because because um we are so spoiled by the beautiful hubble images and they hubble, look yes almost six yeah They look almost exactly like like the Hubble images. Um, yeah. But then, when you when you then compare them one by one between Hubble and James Webb, then you all of a sudden see that James Webb is much more brilliant, much more contentful. Mm. There's there's much more information, um, and uh, there are things in the James Webb images that you don't see in Hubble. So that this is exactly yes. the, the the new discovery potential. And so, you know, in, in um, sensitivity, James Webb is about 100 times more sensitive than Hubble. And in the discovery and the detection of um, molecules in planetary atmospheres, it's about 10 time, 10,000 times more sensitive. So the real excitement mm. and what really basically makes you fall off your chair is this, this huge amount of additional information that you get and Yes, that will take a long time to really digest. I, I think we are now all jumping on the data, but I believe mm. that these twenty thousand scientists will very soon be brain limited, and the data will be with us for a very <laughs> long time. I'm so glad you just mentioned your being underwhelmed by that imagery because I I felt the same, but I didn't want to like um, say it out loud because I would expect the entire <laughs> space community to come after me. Um, but yes, uh, you're absolutely right. We are spoiled by Hubble. But um, I think um, beautiful pictures we've seen from Hubble, they're just one side of, of the coin. The other side is that we get to see something that Hubble was not and is not and will never be able to see in the first place because Hubble works in visible light. Um, here, James Webb is infrared. And so... Infrared Indeed. lets us peer into the past, into far um, further into Much the past than away. Hubble will ever be able Indeed. to. Could you could you um, speak to this? Why that is in the first place? Indeed. So and, why can we see that, further? Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And one aspect that the, uh, James Webb also has is the spectroscopy. I mean, behind each of these yes. images is a thousand more informations um, with the spectrum. Yeah. But let's let's talk about infrared first. So, so James Webb has three unique features uh, which the infrared um, allows us. Um, let's first talk about the dust and star star and dust clouds. Sorry, gas and dust clouds. For instance, in the galactic center. So you know our own galactic center. When you put a telescope on it, has a big black um, uh, cloud, and so when mm -hmm. you go in the infrared, you can look through it. 
Uh, mm. we, we sometimes make this experiment when we have day of open house and we have an infrared camera that people can look at. You can put somebody in a trash bag in one of these black bags and you don't see him uh, or her. And then when you put the infrared camera on and you can see through that trash bag. And that's exactly what James Webb can do even in our own galactic center. And, what kind uh, of then, what kind of dust what what kind of dust are we talking about? So is is that dust dust as we know it from very fine sand? What kind of dust is that in those clouds? It's 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 even finer. It's 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 even it's about a micron sized um, uh, regolith. Dust. You, uh, yeah, but it's not regolith uh, because the basically the regolith is produced from the dust. So so the dust is more or less the building block. It's 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 okay. not um, dust that comes from breaking things, but it is actually the uh, the dust that is created the in supernova explosion. Yes, it's the the prime primeval dust. So, so it's, the, know, it's instance, the building block. It's the building block of rocks of a planet. In, in, yes, of a planet. So so if I go out now um, and pick up a rock that used to be dust in one of those clouds, is that right? Yes, in, indeed. Um, wow. So uh, when when you look, for instance, you know the famous horsehead nebula or the fingers of mm, creation. Yes. Uh, or even yes. this uh, Carina rim, that uh, the wall of the Carina. This is all basically dust, and that 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 dust has been produced in the atmospheres of stars. You know, stars okay. are producing yes. mm -hmm. ev everything apart from hydrogen and helium had to be produced by stars. They they are creating the elements in their bellies. But when when um, for instance a red giant is pushing out the wind, then the in this wind the elements are coagulated into these little dust grains and they are poured out um, from supernova explosions and so on. So the dust and the elements are distributed around in the interstellar medium and that is where the so new stars, stars are forming. Stars had to die for us, you and I, to exist. Indeed. And we, we even know from the solar system our own sun has at least gone through three previous supernova explosions because each of these supernova mm. explosions um, imprints uh, some kind of pattern in the chemical um, distribution. And so we know that our sun, before it was even born, uh, was already um, stardust from other stars uh, before. <laughs> You're absolutely mind-blowing. Wow. <laughs> okay, so this was the first element. We can look through, star through gas and dust yes. clouds. Um, the second element is um, that the telescope itself is... Um, uh, cool, so it doesn't radiate, and therefore it is much more sensitive. And when we talk about uh, exoplanets, for instance, um, these are very tiny specks around a very bright star, and so they are extremely hard to see. Uh, but you know, the stars have their maximum emission more or less in the visible, where we are seeing, while the planet mm -hmm. has its maximum in the in the in the warm, I mean, infrared. And so if you go to the infrared range, then the star gets dimmer, but the planet gets brighter. And so the, the mm -hmm. relation, the ratio between star and planet is getting much better in the, in the infrared. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why James Webb, for instance, in, when it studies exoplanets, is about 10,000 times more sensitive than, uh, than Hubble. Mm -hmm. But now let's so come to will, the real... So yes. So it, there will be a possibility, uh, speaking of exoplanets, there will be a possibility if we shine James Webb's eyes on the TRAPPIST system, for example, um, yes. to potential exoplanets, we will be able to determine if there is organic leftovers present, yes or no. So, so you know that uh, the first spectrum that has been shown, this was from a Jupiter-sized planet near to a, a relatively bright host star. Uh, the star shines through the planetary atmosphere, and when the planet moves in front of the star, then we can mm. actually discern the individual molecules, and we saw water. So that was already um, a surprise that you have like a Jupiter liquid water. atmosphere. No, water, uh, water vapor. So it, it's basically... Ah, okay. Water vapor in the in the hot atmosphere of this uh, Jupiter-type uh, planet. Now, when we are looking at Trappist, we already know from from Hubble that this is very very likely um, um, uh, surf, um, sorry rocky rocky surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we do not yet know whether there are clouds or, or what the, what the atmosphere is. So James Webb will first um, identify the, uh, the the composition of the atmosphere. 
and can in principle say whether a planet is habitable or not. Uh, hmm. But whether we will really see fingerprints of molecules that have been made from organic, from 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 plants or uh, for, from life, this is very questionable. I, I think this mm -hmm. is more or less nature has to be nice to us to to for us to discover that with James Webb. I mean, this is the holy grail in a sense, but I I would not wish to promise that right now. But we could perhaps um, see traces of methane. And methane being a leftover, a product of organic processes, right? Yes. No, this this is true. Uh, we could, if we are lucky, uh, we could also, for instance, there is a theory that the nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere, not only the oxygen is produced by algae, but there is also the idea that the nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere is actually a, um, a remnant of a biological activity. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, our knowledge is not yet complete there, and so I would not really exclude or or, or conclude too early. But um, in, in principle, even the fact that we can see uh, other molecules in other atmospheres atmospheres of planets is mind-boggling. It is. It is absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm always interrupting you. Were you were no no already no, not now going <laughs> going to the next, but. Um, so far, as, as if I'm informed uh, correctly, we haven't been able to, not even Hubble hasn't been able to take even a blurry image of a potential exoplanet. Will and that James Webb be will not, possible James Webb with will James not Webb? Be. No. Okay. I mean, okay. It's, it's not quite true. Um, it depends on how large the planet is and how far it is away from its star. So, for instance, even mm -hmm. Hubble... And even the, the Keck telescopes on ground have already imaged individual exoplanets and they can even see them running around. But those are Jupiter or more size exoplanets relatively far mm -hmm. out. But I think what you are referring to is a kind of the Earth-like planet around yes. a solar type yeah. star. And this this is really, um, uh, this will not even be possible with uh, James Webb. Uh, but, so but no, let me, let me, uh, yeah, no pale blue let, dot let, again. No, not yet, not yet. But, but <laughs> let me maybe shine a, shine a light to this question also. When you were talking about TRAPPIST, um, you know that mm -hmm. the TRAPPIST system is seven very likely rocky planets which are around us, um, a red dwarf star. Uh, yes. And they, and they are so close to their star that the whole TRAPPIST system is comparable to the Jupiter or Saturn system. So you can imagine mm -hmm. something like Jupiter with with its 50 or, or, or 60 moons around. So you have a whole solar system which is about <laughs> that that size. And this is the reason mm -hmm. why it was relatively easy to discover the TRAPPIST um, uh, stars. The problem mm -hmm. is that these red dwarf stars are kind of un unhealthy environments because they are um, uh, hicking up, they, they are... Um, ejecting a lot of um, x-rays and and uh, they they have uh, mm -hmm. similar to the sun they are flares but continuously so mm -hmm. it is likely that even if there would be conditions for life that life would not be very uh, sustainable on these rocky surfaces so that's the reason why ultimately you would really like to look at a solar type star and not at um, a, a red dwarf mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful now, um, let's go even further back yes. in time. And this is also so something now. that James Webb excels at. Uh, what's the deal here? Yeah, and I wouldn't even say excel. I mean, as you said before, this is the only uh, possibility to go there even. Uh, so, um, you know, the universe is expanding uh, and all yeah. galaxies are moving away from each other. And the further they are away from us, the faster they move. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that we Which are is not still kind nobody, of strange. Yeah, it's not that that <laughs> nobody likes us and therefore is moving away from us. On a, but the whole universe is expanding. You yes. you can imagine this a little bit like one of these um, uh, yeast cakes. So you make a cake with um, uh, what's the term, the English word for rosinen for um, raisins. Uh, raisins, yes, yes. So you have a, you I have hate a dough them. with. Yes. <laughs> so you have a dough with raisins. Uh, you put the dough in the oven and the whole dough is increasing. And that means that the raisins are moving away from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
the, the, the raisin which are on the furthest to the left is moving away from the raisin on the right the fastest because the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the, the speed with which they move away depends on the distance of each other. Mm -hmm. Now, transforming that into galaxies, they are moving away from us. And if they are moving away, there is something that is called the Doppler effect. That, that is how the mm -hmm. police is measuring your speed uh, because you, you can actually measure how the waves are compressed or uh, expanded depending on how fast you move. And you know this, for instance, when a police car is coming, it comes da 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 da, da when it's moving away. Exactly. So, so the, exactly. So mm -hmm. This is the Doppler effect, and and translated into light, uh, it means that if a galaxy is moving away from us, the light is shifted into the red part of the uh, uh, spectrum, and when it's coming towards us, it's moved to the blue part. But mm -hmm. since everybody's moving away from us, all the light is red shifted. And and it's becoming invisible to the visible, to, uh, to our visible uh, eyes. So, yeah. The, fur the further the, the galaxies are away from us, the faster they move and the more redshifted is the light. And so this, the light which originally has been created in the visible is now shifted into the infrared and, and even beyond. And so that means that there are objects which are in the universe, but you cannot see them with your normal visible light telescope and but when you look at in the infrared then all of a sudden you you see them and so this wow. is a unique i mean huge um, effect and that basically allows james webb to look at the early universe at the very early stars wow what is what is early the universe is if <laughs> i'm not mistaken 13.878 billion years old eight yes. so how and, and how far do we uh, get back and and we have already seen uh, down to basically 380,000 years after the Big Bang. That is when the universe was like a hot fireball. So you can imagine mm -hmm. the whole universe looks like a huge sun, like the, the surface mm -hmm. of the sun. Um, and we are, we have already seen this surface uh, in the microwave background. So, so th this was also light, which was originally emitted in the visible but it has mm -hmm. been shifted by a factor of thousand into the radio. So it's now appearing mm -hmm. in the radio. And so this is where we, this is the most distant where we can actually look with, with um, electromagnetic waves. Now the, the, no, the standard picture is that then after the universe is cooling down and this um, uh, surface of the hot fireball is basically uh, vanishing, there is a dark period where nothing happens, where, where basically just the gravity is pulling on the matter and is coagulating. And then when there is enough density, stars can actually start to shine. So, mm. so you, you have a ball of gas. The ball of gas mm. is co uh, collected, co um, coagulated, it's getting thicker and thicker. And when the density in the center is sufficient, then all of a sudden the flame is starting, the nuclear burning uh, is starting that is also happening in the center of the sun. So hydrogen is um, fused into helium and that is creating mm -hmm. energy. And so you have all of a sudden uh, specks of light which start to shine. And I imagine that like like yeah. fireflies in June in the in the dark forest. Yes, indeed, yeah. indeed, like that. Yeah, and the and the standard picture is that this should happen roughly three hundred million years after the Big Bang. So, so you would like to look back to 13.5 billion years, roughly. Mm -hmm. Currently, I think that the most distant object is 13.1 billion or so, so something like 900 million after the Big Bang. And so you want to go much closer to the Big Bang, uh, to 300 million. But if our theory about the primordial black holes is true, then the first light would already happen 50 million years after the Big Bang. Hmm. Uh, five zero. And... This is not a matter of how far J James Webb can look, but how far are there actually objects to look? So when do the fireflies mm -hmm. appear? And this is mm -hmm. where James mm -hmm. Webb is actually that. James Webb can do that. It's the only telescope that can do that. Fascinating. So in fact, like technically, the universe gives us a barrier um, where the universe lets itself be observed by our oh, yeah. uh, um, by our feeble human eyes um, slash um, instruments we are coming up with. But at some point, there's a barrier we cannot go beyond and maybe we'll never go be uh, able to go beyond because there was no 
any kind of 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 spectrum we could observe is is that right so could we ever could we ever observe the big bang yeah so now now when you say the universe makes a barrier i mean one of these barriers is if there is nothing there to observe then you don't see anything so the universe yes. has to basically work with us and, de and and create things that you can look at but this this hot fireball um th that we observed in the radio the microwave background is in a sense the barrier for electromagnetic waves so you cannot mm -hmm. this is the same way as you cannot look inside the surface of the sun because the the surface is just um, thick uh, optically thick mm -hmm. But there are other techniques where you can, in principle, look through. Um, one of, one of them is uh, gravitational waves. Um, so you know mm. that uh, mm -hmm. when the when, for instance, two black holes are colliding, and you are getting this dance, and then gravitational waves are produced, and in the end you are getting something like called a chirp. So it starts like, and then two black mm -hmm. holes have been merged. Now. Hmm. Again, if, if our theory about the primordial black holes is true, then you would expect such mergers already to happen with inside the hot fireball. So, so it's almost like mm. you cannot see into the sun, but you can hear mm -hmm. what is inside. And that is, uh, huh. you would still be able to observe the Big Bang in, in gravitational waves. Maybe that's why podcasts are so important because the our ears are so sensitive yes. to things that even our eyes can see. Indeed, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, I don't know who it was, but who uh, who created that um, deep field, that Hubble deep field? Uh, who was it again? Was it wasn't it the director uh, Bob, himself? Uh, Bob Williams at some. Uh, yeah, Bob Bob Williams was the first one who had the idea of the deep field. Yes, and then and, yes, and you, then Steve Beckwith uh, extended it into the ultra deep field. Yes, so so the idea behind it was to direct the focus of the instrument of Hubble um, not towards an object, but towards a dark patch um, of night sky, and that is towards that empty is space, yeah. exactly empty space. That was revolutionary, and all of a sudden, um, as it turns out, there is in fact no empty empty space up there, and this is something Actually, that's. Utterly, utterly uh, um, interesting. It, it was it was kind of revolutionary, but I have to say that independently, we uh, from the Rosa uh, Observatory were already planning and doing a deep survey in X-rays, uh, which was basically looking at empty space in X-rays, uh, because the, uh, I worked together with Ricardo Giacconi, who also was later the director of Space Telescope Science Institute as well. And Ricardo Giacconi has discovered this diffuse glow in the sky, which is um, some kind of so-called X-ray background. And his mm -hmm. dream was always to point the telescope to this X-ray background and then to resolve it uh, and see whether what the objects are. So, so we in with the Rosa Deep Service, and that, that's how I made my career. We actually independently from the Hubble Deep Field uh, had a, a Rosa Deep and Ultra Deep Field, and it was a, a very big pity that the two teams somehow could not get together because Rosat was launched mm. basically the same year as, as Hubble. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the two teams were independently pushing deep. And indeed, when you look at the sky, the Rosat deep field is only a few degrees away from the Hubble deep field. And at that mm -hmm. time, it was not possible to overlay the two fields so that you had basically mm. a field both in the X-rays and in the uh, deep um, uh, Hubble image. Mm -hmm. When then Steve Beckwith went to the ultra deep field, so he went uh, another factor of 10 deeper, he actually invited a big group of scientists all around the world and he, he also took into account the needs from other wave bands. And so the Chandra <laughs> deep field south, which is or the Hubble deep field, ultra deep field south, is now overlaid on one of uh, each other. And so now since then, all of these deep fields are somehow coordinated between all wavelengths. And this is also mm. uh, amazing. It's so that James Webb will follow that path and will actually not open its own deep field, but look into into areas that are already well covered. Wow, well, wow! Well. So uh, for our audience and and myself to remind myself um, that deep field uh, anyone um, can see um, on on YouTube or wherever um, moving images uh, lurk these days. It's a deep field. It's a 
if if you go look on your favorite search engine, um, Hubble Deep Field or Ultra Deep Field, you will find that mind-boggling zoom into the universe. Um, so how far how far does that look into? So the, I think the the most distant galaxies that Hubble found were roughly at redshift ten, uh, which is something like um, thirteen point one billion years so mm -hmm. back into the distance uh actually the the, the picture that james webb has uh, published the the very first that joe biden uh, had mm -hmm. uh, we had the honor that joe biden has um, unveiled is mm. this is actually um, making use of an additional effect namely gravitational lensing where mm -hmm. it looked at a big cluster of galaxies which had about a thousand galaxies um and mm -hmm. these thousand galaxies, they are swimming in a sea of dark matter. Uh, and mm -hmm. this dark matter has the power to lens the light from the galaxies behind it. So so all the galaxies mm -hmm. which are behind that lens, they appear like these ring-like structures, like, like, like mm -hmm. little arclets. And mm -hmm. this is actually similar to when you, uh, in the evening, take a glass of red wine and you look at a piece <laughs> of light through the red wine and you see it also uh, appear in these so-called Distorted. Mm -hmm. distorted but but mm -hmm. this way the light from the galaxies which are behind the cluster is actually amplified and um, mm -hmm. magnified and pulled forward and so this field very likely already contains uh, signals of much older light uh, maybe going down to 13.5 billion years or so but but we will it takes it will take a while until we get all the spectra analyzed and and so on it was very nice that the very first field mm -hmm already showed a spectrum of a Redshift 8 galaxy, which, which uh, mm -hmm. was just there by chance. What, what, what does Redshift 8 mean? So like um, to, for, so to that, the lay person's uh, ear. Yeah, so Redshift 10 means that the universe was about a tenth of its uh, size and that all the light is shifted by a factor of 10 roughly. So visible light is shifted by a factor of 10 into the infrared. Uh, okay. Redshift 8 means uh, the universe a bit younger, one-eighth of its current um, age. And I don't have, I mean, you have to calculate the formula, but it is must be something like 12.9 um, or 13.0 billion years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let's go back to James Webb. Um, who, who gets to work with that beautiful piece of technology? So first, um, I mean, the, the data that has been released now is public to everybody. So this, this was actually selected mm -hmm. in a way to whet people's appetite to get them uh, uh, exposed and to, to learn how to, to use it. Uh, then, you know, the people who have built the uh, instruments um, and also some other people from the web interdisciplinary science team, they get about half a year of so-called guaranteed observing time which has already started and it is interleaved with uh, with a normal observing time. And then the very, is that the very per, first... Per year, half a, half a year every year or no, just no, half no, a year only in the, in the beginning. Year. Only okay. half a year in the very first time. Okay. From then on, uh, the data, the, the James Webb observing time is regularly every year open to the public for, for new ideas. So, so this is what we call oh. an announcement of opportunity. And mm -hmm. about two years ago, uh, the first announcement was uh, done and um, people were applying uh, about maybe for a, about a thousand different projects and about 10-15% um, of those were actually granted. And so mm -hmm. the first year of observing time is already, the, the astronomers already know who will get what and also roughly when, because the, uh, James Webb cannot observe the, all the sky all the time. So, so you can roughly calculate when your target is becoming visible. And so mm -hmm. therefore, I know that my targets will probably only become visible early next year. And so I have to wait a mm -hmm. little bit more. Um, it was actually very interesting. You know that European Space Agency is a partner to the James Webb Telescope, mm -hmm. but we are... I mean, if you calculate the total amount of stuff that we have pro contributed there, we have a 15% share of the telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, the observing time is distributed competitively, and Europe won about 30% of the observing time. So mm -hmm. we are quite mm -hmm. well served. <laughs> and mm -hmm. this is similar on Hubble, where we also nice. get typically 25% of the time. Nice. Whoever negotiated that, kudos, I must say. 
<laughs> no, it's actually that the, the the data on all the big observatories is, is completely open. So, I mean, the the American colleagues and friends are also getting about forty percent of the, okay. for instance, the uh, XMM Newton time. This is just, mm -hmm. I, I think, it's just a big family who is uh, yes. selecting the time according to the best. Um, May the best win. <laughs> in in theory, um, could I apply for some observatory instrument time, uh, or telescope yeah. time as a, as a layperson? Just I mean, like it's it's all uh, uh, depending on a good idea. Is that right? If you have something that nobody else has, uh, <laughs> some great idea. Or, I mean, you know, there are some citizen scientists, for instance, who yes. are going into yes. the archives and they are looking for, like, for instance, you, there's this huge Gaia archive and, and uh, yeah. 1.8 billion stars and s several million binary stars and so on. And there must be something, so, uh, yes. a, a little gold nugget in there. And if you, as a citizen scientist, discover such a gold nugget, then you can immediately go to James Webb and says, "I want to observe that." <laughs> and I, uh, and you, the good thing is in the in the James Webb and also in, in Hubble right now, uh, it is a so-called double-blind review process. That that means the, mm -hmm. that you don't know the reviewers, but yes. the reviewers also don't know you. So so it's anonymous. Okay. And that, so they don't even know that you are not a professional. I mean, they just look at mm -hmm. the idea and then they say, oh, wow, that's great. And I've never heard about this. And then you get the time. Nice. Great. Um, let's talk about um, the mind-boggling discoveries that James Webb is, is making. And I think, I think that the international um, community of scientists of especially of communicators they are sparing us of a little bit of information that would explode our minds in the first place because usually they talk about um galaxies being discovered here this tiny speck is a galaxy but they never say what a galaxy in fact is and that a yes. galaxy usually <laughs> never comes smaller than 300 light years in diameter so This, to me, is completely insane. So if we take a look at a random image now from James Webb, and if we see like 100 or 200 or 1,000 specks of light in there, and someone says, that's a galaxy, we should always <laughs> consider the fact that this galaxy Galaxies is at least are huge. 300 light years in diameter. How does that feel to you? How do you come to the 300 light years? I, I think they should even be larger, right? They, they should maybe. Yeah, 300, no, at least no, that's that's why I'm saying at least 300 light years yeah, because yeah, yeah, the yeah, smallest yeah, yeah, galaxy yeah, yeah. is around 300 and the biggest 400 million light years. That's yes, I think yes, 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 somewhere yes, yes. in between. Okay, I mean there there is maybe even a continuum between what we call globular clusters. So those are mm -hmm. actually round balls of stars and they can have thousands of stars themselves so they might be the smallest um, remnants of, of, of <laughs> galaxies um let me t say two two things i mean first what we have seen so far is based on about five days of data and mm. since then um in on twitter and so on you get new stuff so there's already very beautiful new images that have appeared on twitter which are almost as impressive or maybe even more impressive than the The five days. So every five days, we are getting more or less the same amount of information mm -hmm. again. And what was so hugely powerful was that, I mean, these images were compared to Hubble images, uh, sometimes of much longer observing time. Mm -hmm. and, and so even with much longer, with, uh, with much shorter observing time, you could already see uh, new things. Now, I think you have to, when you talk about galaxies, you have to somehow fold in the age of these galaxies, whether they mm -hmm. are young and whether they have been formed in the early universe or not. Because in general, Hubble has already shown us that when you look back in time, the typical galaxies get much smaller than the, the nearby galaxies mm -hmm. that we know of. So, so mm -hmm. when we are talking about um, billion, um, uh, I, I think our galaxy has 200 billion stars um, the Andromeda <laughs> Nebula has about 200 billion stars uh, then they were at least a factor of 10 smaller uh, on average mm -hmm. uh, 
And indeed, so you can in principle go, go to dwarf galaxies, which have only a mm -hmm. thousand stars or globular clusters, which are quite, quite tiny. And so I think this is illustrating that we still don't fully understand how galaxies are forming in the first place. Uh, we know that when galaxies mm. are merging, that they can transform their uh, appearance. They can change from disk galaxies into so-called elliptical galaxies. But the, the early part and the smallest piece of the spectrum is not, not known yet. So mm. this is mind-boggling, I believe. Hmm. Does it bother you sometimes that you may not know who is responsible for all of this? I mean, like, it drives me absolutely crazy to know what's going on out there and not know <laughs> where all this comes from. Who is from. responsible this is, for it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, this is uh, that, that's touching a very in, in, interesting question because a lot of us have this idea of somebody and when, when we say somebody, it's just typically yeah. a human face with a white yes. beard and so on yeah. uh, doing, <laughs> doing Reaching something. out with his finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> now I, I believe this, this person or this non-person, this entity, <laughs> is actually has been created by man itself. So, so in this picture, the, the, the image of God that we have in our heads has been made by humans and not by somebody else. Mm. Yeah. Um, there is a very uh, uh, kind of thorough religious um, theoretician uh, called Feuerbach. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. remember his first name. And Ludwig. he said, um, Ludwig Feuerbach, yes, that's right. He said, if, if you have a population of triangles, then their God will have also three corners. So it will also be yes. a triangle uh, God. Yes. But there's a very interesting, and actually I, I'm frequently talking to also to uh, priests and religious um, theoreticians and so on. There's a very interesting concept that has already been presented by Thomas von Aquin uh, in the mm. 1300s or so, where he said that if if I take out everything from uh, some space, I mean, I take um, the earth, mm -hmm. I remove everything, I, I remove even the earth, and then there should be nothing left, but there is still something left, and this is what he called the ipsum esse, the, the, the sein an sich, the, the being mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. And this is very similar to the concept of dark energy of, of, a, of an energy which is basically um, permeating everything and everywhere and at every time and it's always there and it's always larger than anything else so, so you know the dark energy the, the energy mm -hmm. content is bigger than of dark matter and of the normal matter so in this picture this is more or less God the, the, hmm. the nothingness which mm -hmm. is full of energy and is everywhere can create everything That's more or less what the power that we ascribe to this um, creator. Um, but it is just a scalar vector field. Uh, sorry, a scalar field. <laughs> uh, and so it's just a different language. Physics has a language. Religion has a language. Mm -hmm. But currently the, the cosmological picture with an inflation, that means with a kind of genesis moment, uh, coming out of an uh, indefinite uh, power field, um, which I think in the Bible is called Tohu Vabohu. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the languages are coming quite close to each other. Interesting. Is that really from the Bible, that term? Because, I mean, like a Tohu, tohu, tohu Vabohu. It's, it's usually, yes. it's, yeah, now that is interesting. Tohu Vabohu is in the first sentence of the Bible when you read it in Hebraic. Uh, it, is, it is sometimes translated as um, Wüst und Leer, the Erde war Wüst und Leer, empty and But it is this chaotic Void. kind of uh, mm -hmm. status of the universe before it was even formed. Hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm lacking, I'm lacking words to 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 follow up because I mean, like this is all too deep. Because, I mean, like seriously, we are not even we're close to nothingness in the universe um, with our feeble human thoughts and and whatnot. But at the same time, but there's a theory. Um, I can't remember what kind of philosopher came up with it that the universe is gaining knowledge about itself through human, um, through the human mind. So it's realizing itself through the human mind. 
So mm -hmm. that's an that's an interesting idea also because without the human mind, maybe the universe wouldn't know it exists in itself. Whatever that um, means. I, I I usually try to compare this with the different timescales involved. I mean, we we have already talked about the huge um, space scales, um, but mm -hmm. when you talk about timescales, there is this. Um, a very nice comparison. If I uh, put the whole lifetime of the universe into one year, mm -hmm. and so the Big Bang starts on 1st of January, 00, zero and today mm -hmm. we are at the Sylvester Bang uh, uh, at the next year, and mm -hmm. then you can actually very nicely tie all the different things uh, together. So the, the hot fireball has w what we call 380,000 years, was 15 minutes at that time. Mm -hmm. And the very first stars happen uh, are formed on 4th of January or, or so. Mm -hmm. um, in this picture, the Earth is created on the 9th of September. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after the 9th of September, it took only three weeks when we saw the very first signals of DNA on the Earth, so the, hmm. the, the blue algae and so on. So this was 28th of September. And then it took another three months before there was this explosion of uh, of uh, evolution, the Cambrian explosion, where all Cambrian of a sudden millions explosion. of mm -hmm. Ca Cambrian explosion. That happened mm -hmm. on 20th of December. Hmm. And on the 24th of December, the trees were ready, <laughs> the, 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 the Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. And the humans, <laughs> uh, basically the, the humans started to show up uh, Around prime time on twenty on thirty first of uh, December, to so target show at 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 twenty hours, <laughs> uh, so four four hours before midnight, the humans were appearing. Uh, Jesus Christ, um, the whole uh, all every religion on Earth only happened in the last second or so, one one second before uh, the big uh, the the Sylvester Bang. and our own life is about a um, uh, blink of an eye, uh, 0 0.2 seconds. Uh, would be basically 100 <laughs> years in the in the scale of the universe. So now the problem is that humans are only there for the last few seconds. And if you say the whole universe is getting its um, meaning from the human mind, that could only have happened in the last second. Um, and I don't know what the rest of the universe uh, would think about that. <laughs> I don't think so, Wonderful. honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Günther Hasinger, what... Um, this is a maybe a little more serious um, and, and less philosophical, but we are confronting ourselves as human beings with a plethora of issues these days. So we have we're confronting ourselves with wars, with climate change, with every every kind of issue wherever we look. Um, now the question could arise, and the question is asked. Why is a project like James Webb still of interest and will be of interest in the future? Shouldn't we do something else with that kind of money? So what speaks for um, James Webb still? You, you can ask that same question for every investment in basic research, um, not just uh, James Webb, but James Webb is a clearly a very highly visible uh, thing. Uh, I mean, first... It is built because of the curiosity of humans, and the curiosity is there independently of um, all the problems that we have. Um, mm -hmm. there, there is, uh, we will always try to find out what's going on, and we will always, uh, and have always invested that, and it has always paid off. Um, I think mm -hmm. a very important factor is that we need to give our young generation um, something to dream of, some inspiration that they even are willing to continue in the future. Then we need a lot of engineers and scientists. If we want to survive this mess, uh, we need lots of engineers. And currently, uh, engineers are not very um, uh, sought after. So so I believe the <laughs> inspiration that you get... Um, the, so, sorry, they are very well sought after by the companies, yes. but not the young yes. kids. Um, yes. So this alone is already a po important point. But I believe there's also the other factor that through this basic um, research, we are developing new technologies that are then translating into our daily life. And the cycle with which that happens, the time scale is typically longer than uh, the war. It's longer than mm -hmm. um, a, a politician's lifetime and so on. So, so we need to have, I mean, this generational contract that we do something that our kids then um, uh, are mm -hmm. having um, ben benefit from. 
this is very important to continue, even in view of the more local uh, difficulties. Look, for instance, at how quickly we got the, the um, uh, vaccine vaccine for COVID. Yes. Uh, yes. And that was because of 10, 15 years of uh, basic research in this area that, that uh, has enabled that. If we would not have done that, um, we would still I mean, suffer much more. Hmm. I'm afraid I have to close. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, one last question, a very quick one. Um, the last question would be what, because we're setting up a Spotify playlist for that podcast with um, the guest's favorite musical pieces that go together with space. What's your favorite piece you would like to introduce to the Spotify playlist? <laughs> Um, I have to check. I mean, the David Bowie songs are quite great there. Um, yes. You know that I I, I I I had a band and we also had a CD. Uh, maybe I find a piece on on my own CD. But I'm if I only am I'm allowed one, I have to think yes. about it. It's 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 probably um, the David Bowie song. Um, Major of Tom, the astronaut. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, it's been, a, it's been a, a great pleasure talking with you, especially considering all um, the busy moments you're experiencing these days. Thank you so much, Günther Hasinger. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure too. And, and time ran too quickly, unfortunately. <laughs> How many more questions would I have had? But an ESA director should be forgiven, I guess. Which songs should I add to the Spotify list now? Major Tom is too easy and already taken. I'll get back to the director and try to push for more. Hopefully, we'll find something. So, thanks for being here today. Until next time. In the meantime, there is lots of more content, space content for you out there. So go look for Space Cafe Radio. No matter what language you speak, Spacewatch Global has most of you covered. So head over to spacewatch.global and search for Space Cafe Radio, you hungry nerds. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. As always, I'm really looking forward to next time. Bye-bye now. <laughs>